कहेंगे get this to come up here there we go all right well good evening everyone welcome to our december webinar my name is eleanor rangers i'm the president of the southeastern pennsylvania cold war historical society we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to preserving history through the memories of those who created it and uh as you may know we've had this history in our backyard webinar series previously an, an all live lecture series but now we sort of do both uh, with our programming. But this is, uh, again, our December program, and I will be introducing our speaker momentarily. Um, I do want to also thank the Fuge in Warminster, Pennsylvania, for allowing us the use of their facility for live programming, um, as well as um, a display room, which I'll give you guys an update about um, in a few moments. But they've been a wonderful partner uh, with our educational uh, endeavors. <clears throat> I do want to also do the, the usual plug, being a nonprofit organization, we always welcome donations if you so choose uh, to, uh, to do that. So keep us in mind if you um, are looking for uh, a worthy cause. All of the proceeds of the donations go straight back into the organization to support a number of things like guest lectures, um, eventually transcriptions of, of the number of interviews that we've done over the years, which I'd like to digitize, uh, which I would like to uh, transcribe. Um, and also website maintenance, because we have a pretty nice website that we upgraded to and displays that, uh, as I just mentioned. And speaking of displays, um, the Fuge actually gave us a small room off the main entrance earlier this year that we've been in the process of converting into a display room to commemorate the history of the Naval Air Development Center, of which the Johnsville Centrifuge was part of that, uh, that uh, facility. And these are just a couple snapshots of, to give you a flavor of what we are putting together in the, in the room, we'll have a couple of display cabinets and, and a lot of signage that basically will highlight some of the key history related to um, the facility. So we're looking forward to being able to uh, formally, um, you know, debut that. I do want to also point out, um, you probably see the mannequin there on the picture on the right. That's actually a prototype uh, Nomex flight suit. And the reason why that's on display is that actually Warminster, the Naval Air Development Center, uh, developed Nomex along with DuPont back in the 1960s. And the woman scientist who uh, was basically led the developmental program is going to be inducted to the National Inventors Hall of Fame in May, in May 2024. Uh, so we actually put in that nomination. We're pretty excited that she will be acknowledged uh, for that accomplishment. Um, so another, you know, interesting, prominent piece of history associated with Warminster. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel. I do try to keep it updated with content. We do, as you can, as you already heard, we do record these events. So I do upload these webinars to that site after the program. Um, but as I come across other Cold War related uh, films on YouTube, I like to upload those so people can enjoy them all in one place. So definitely would encourage you to check that out. We also have a Facebook page. Basically, the content on that more or less mirrors. Um, the programming that we do here uh, on the webinars programs and, and live programming. Uh, but I do also post some, you know, newsworthy articles related to Cold War history that I come across as well. And those will also feed into um, our website. But if you are on social media, uh, definitely check us out there. Um, I will be muting everyone um, except for the speaker. Uh, when we when we start to preserve bandwidth. And also, if you could um, also cut your um, video feeds as well, that also helps with the um, helps with our bandwidth as well during the program. But then, of course, for Q&A, we'll open up the lines again. Um, we have just completed our 2024 programming. Um, and this is basically a quick snapshot of um, our pretty ambitious programs for 2024. Um, Something that I'm pretty excited about this, you know, upcoming year is in addition to our 
webinars and our lot and some uh, live programming that we'll be doing in Warminster. We also will have a movie night where we're going to be doing a screening of the old movie X-15, followed by um, a Zoom Q&A with Michelle Evans, who actually we had speak about the X-15 history back in 2019 prior to the pandemic. So really looking forward to that program uh, in mid-February. Um, we also will have a special symposium um, on Sunday, April 14th, actually, uh, regarding the Berlin Airlift. Um, so I'm definitely looking forward to that. We have three speakers lined up for that. And then in July, more to come on this, but we are planning on a special um, event that will be held at the Centrifuge on uh, Project Mercury and Apollo. Next year is the 65th anniversary of the beginning of Centrifuge training for the Mercury astronauts at the Johnsville Centrifuge. And it's also the 55th anniversary of Apollo 11, the first lunar landing. So we are planning on a celebration um, on July 20th, very apropos, the anniversary of the lunar landing. So more to come on that. So um, basically we'll be, I'll be also sending out announcements on a monthly basis. So if you are in our email distribution list, you will get announcements regarding all these programs. Speaking of which, our, uh, we'll be kicking off the year with our first webinar on the um, ENIAC women, um, early computerization. So I'm pretty excited to be able to bring this um, talk to you. Mark Massey uh, will be giving that talk again in January. So please join us uh, for that uh, presentation. And then of course, in February, as I mentioned, we'll be having a movie night uh, with a screening of the movie X-15. And this is again, the symposium that we're planning in April with three speakers talking about very as various aspects of the Berlin airlift. And of course that July 20th program, and we'll be sending out more information of that as we develop. So that's all I've got. And now let's introduce our guest speaker this evening. David Stumpf is well known to this organization. We have had him um, as a guest speaker on various missile programs um, on a number of occasions. Uh, always a wealth of information um, regarding these um, regarding these rockets. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to this evening's presentation as well. Now, incidentally, David is actually a retired plant biochemist and he lives uh, with his wife in Tucson, Arizona. And he has written a number of books. I understand that he is in the process of getting galleys for his sixth book that will be coming out soon. So we may be scheduling him for a briefing on that. Uh, that topic sometime in the near future. Uh, but he has written, as, and I've just highlighted three of his books that he's actually spoken about uh, during our webinar programs, uh, Titan, Regulus, and Minuteman. Um, and also uh, uh, David volunteered at the Titan Missile Museum outside of Tucson, and he was a historian there and tour guide for 15 years. And he was also instrumental in the effort to gain national historic monument status for that museum. So without further ado, I am going to hand the podium, if you will, over to David, who is going to be talking about Minuteman missile vulnerability this evening. So David, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn things over to you. Okay, let me... Oh. I don't think they're going south. Hang on. All right. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. I'm not getting my screen. So you shared with me. I did. <clears throat> you should be able to pull up your, your screen. Yeah, I, I just bear with me here. No problem. Give me an opportunity to admit a couple other people to the what is going on webinar. here. I'm oh here, maybe that's what I need. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay. So there this we go. is a, a brief look at Miniman vulnerability and and I need to get to my 
<laughs> There's too many things going on on the screen. I do have it. It's up a brief look at Minuteman vulnerability. So you are sharing your screen now. <laughs> right. I'm trying to get to the controls for the the um, presentation. There we go. Okay, here we go. So the ICBM facility and design verification was an issue that uh, reared its ugly head with the limited test ban treaty. What had happened before the test ban treaty, we, they used uh, various weapons tests in Nevada to test structural responses to air blasts and, and, and ground blasts. But with uh, op, uh, shot Priscilla on 24 June 57 was where they got most of the information for the uh, structural designs for the ICBM facilities. They had arch type structures, a variety of, of German structures that were used in the war that they investigated. They did find that a minimum of five feet of earth was sufficient for radiation protection. But with the test ban treaty, all of a sudden using nuclear weapons uh, was not going to be possible for evaluating the ICBM facilities. Now, it's interesting to me as a Titan historian, they don't discuss anything about, about evaluating the Titan facilities. They only talk about Minuteman, but that's okay. So what they came up with was a high explosive simulation technique or HEST. The Air Force Weapons Laboratory out at Kirtland came up with a, a three-phase program. Phase one was small scale ex experimental development. They could use either uh, detonatable gas or primacord. And they, they looked at a whole bunch of different systems, but these two were the ones they settled on. And phase two would be to take for the experimental uh, small facility test and put it into a larger scale to see if it was doable. And then phase three, hopefully to get to proof tests at operational facilities. So the first one was this using detonatable gas. Now this seems, I'm a plant biochemist by training. So this just seems, well, stupid to me um, to be working with large volumes of highly inflammable explosive gas. But the, the people at Stanford Research Institute had worked with this. So they used it. This is a setup. They had a 12 foot deep swimming pool, 40 feet long and 20 some feet wide. And they had a, a gas bag, a polyethylene bag they filled with this volatile mixture. Then they put water on top of that and then tried to detonate it and see if they get a pressure wave. They could, they got up to 160 to PSIG, which is getting close to what they needed for part of the testing. And this is what it looked like. This is the only picture I could find. So hard to put scale to this, but that's uh, 15,000 gallons of water going up in the air. There were drawbacks of detonatable gas to atmospheric pressure container. They couldn't come up with an economically feasible container. So that was a, pos a problem. Then there were safety concerns working with the volatile and the very explosive gas. So the further research wasn't conducted because they had great success with Primacord. The length of Primacord is wrapped around a, fa a, a frame. We'll get to that in a minute. The angle of the weave determines the speed of the shock wave. It is much simpler than the detonatable gas system. And they had four experiments they used with overburdens of either earth or water. We'll talk about the overburden in just a second. So here's a primer cord system. They took sheets of four by eight sheets of actually I saw some larger sheets, uh, maybe 10 footers 
Um, they wrapped it at this angle, and boy, you see the little arrow. That angle determined the speed of the shock wave. You see that wavy line below it. So they could uh, dial in the, the speed of the shock wave and the overpressure developed pretty uh, routinely. At the bottom there, you see the um, expansions of the combustion products. So that was the shock wave. What this picture doesn't show is the overburden lifting up uh, as, a, as a result of the shock wave. But the uh, framing was really elaborate and uh, expensive. So this is a phase one prime accord experiment. There's the one on the left shows the water setup, and the one on the right the sand. I was fascinated by the, the, the construction. They had a lot of weight to worry about with like four or 500 pounds per square foot. So it wasn't a simple task. There is 320 to 300 to 1300 PSI could be developed, which is enough for initial testing. And the speed of the shock wave was an important variable for trying to uh, mimic the nuclear weapons blast. So with the primal core, they really could dial this in very accurately. The overburden, as I said, was 400 to 500 pounds per square foot. So this is the primer cord experiment instead of the gas bag, similar looking event. The phase one conclusions, both techniques produce adequate simulation, which is good. Primer cord was much safer, even better. The primer cord technique was much more flexible. They had a limited uh, mixture ratios with the gases to get the uh, the PSI they wanted. And then the notion of the motion of the overburden simulated the pressure decay of a surface or air burst. So you get the, the, the pulse of high pressure. Then after that, as it passes by, you get a re rapid reduction in pressure. And so the overburden helped develop both the initial pressure and then when it raised up and increased the volume of the uh, the uh, space that the gases were forming had to lower it quickly. The trouble was the overburden fell back down on the test structure. So they developed some techniques to get around that. So the first phase two large example is 151 by 97 feet. Built over a quarter scale model of a Minuteman launch facility. The goal was 300 PSI overpressure, which would simulate a one megaton air burst at 2,200 feet from the point of detonation. So for some reason, this picture just fascinates me. This is a quarter scale model. You can see the guy on the right. And it's, uh, I don't know why it fascinates me, but this is the upper part of the, um, of a Minuteman silo. It actually represents the launcher equipment room. So this is how they laid it out. They had these large platforms, in this case, 97 feet by 151. They surrounded the edge of it with concrete or steel pilings. Then they build up a floor. And you can see here, oops, there goes my Parkinson's. Um, whoops, hang on. So this just shows some of the detail. I'm not a carpenter, but boy, this was a lot of work and a lot of wood. It was expensive fun. So he built right over the structural model. Then when they detonated it, this was the phase two first shot of a large scale one on 15 December 64. Seven experiments investigated the parameters necessary for controlling the air pressure time histories. 
they really needed to, to fine tune this to make it reasonable for the design uh, verification for the Minuteman facilities. They could simulate up to 3000 PSI for approximately 0.2 minutes. Um, and that was sufficient to simulate the, the first effect of a nearby blast. There was a hardness review panel that met early in the, the uh, building of, after the, the building of the Minuteman silos. And this hardness review panel, I can't find the detail I wanted on this, but 27 items did not meet design specifications. The launch facility was designed for 300 PSI overpressure and the estimated protection after they were built and occupied was rated at 770 PSI. The launch control center was designed to survive 1,000 PSI and was rated at only just about a tenth of that. So this had great concern uh, for obviously for SAC and the Air Force and needed to do something about it. So they came up with the HEST program and they started with HEST 1. It was codenamed code -named Gas Bag Hardness Test, also known as Quick HEST Numero 1. And this is, as a historian, it was very confusing because they had HEST Roman numeral 1, they had HEST Arabic numeral 1, it, um, yeah, it was confusing. Test was conducted at the launch facility Quebec 04 at the 400th Strategic Missile Squadron, a 90th Strategic Missile Wing, uh, Warren Air Force Base. The launch facility was isolated from the rest of the squadron and a ground test missile was installed. This is a typical layout for a Minuteman uh, launch facility. Uh, for those of you that don't know much about them, uh, all the other stuff was, uh, all the other material you see in this map was for the test. But you can see how large an area they put around the very small launch, uh, launch facility. The test was not only to see if the missile, missile would survive, it was also to see if the launcher's support building which is just down a little, well, here I can show with my, it's right, come on hand, right there. So this is what a Minuteman A or 1A or 1B a launch facility looks like. Uh, you can tell this is from Ellsworth because the launcher support building right here is on the left-hand side of the launch uh, tube. So they put these platforms together and they have the, the, the columns and these guys are taking what looks like a, I'm not sure how big that is, maybe, I don't know if they make plywood that in 20 foot sheets, but so they're putting the plywood down then they're gonna put these frames down and on the frames back here are the uh, wrapped series of Primacord and then the, the uh, overburden is uh, on the right-hand side. HEST-1 was successfully conducted on 1 December, 1965, generated the required 300 PSI shock wave and there was little damage to the lost the launch facility or the missiles, so they were pretty happy. HES-2, Launch Control Center D, a Delta-01 at uh, Warren. Above ground structures were removed. And then a uh, 100,000 square foot test structure with 80,000 pounds of prime core. That's a lot of prime core. This shows an example of how the setup was. You can see the guys underneath there. I talked to a former nuclear weapons specialist for Minuteman who worked at Vandenberg, and he got the job to be one of the guys that crawled around underneath. And he said it was a little bit weird because there's so much weight above him, but you can see a steel and wood. It's a pretty impressive 
operation. I like the explosions for some reason, so this is uh, what the explosion looked like. You can see the overburns lifted up, and now the gases are blowing out the sides. Then the overburden's going to smack down, back down. They didn't know at the beginning of this, these um, tests, it was hard to deconvolute the effect of the secondary pressure pulse on the ground from the overburden falling back down. So the test took, took place, again successful. The LCC continued to function despite significant damage from the blast. So the elevator here, the tunnel junction here, and the launcher, the launch control facility support building had to be repaired. But this is the uh, the LCC launch control center, and it fared okay. Um, it's, it's kind of weird to think about it, but as far as the Air Force was concerned, the 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 important part was that the LCC survived and could have launched a missile. I tried to find my copy of some film of. Uh, video taken of mannequins inside an LCC during one of these tests. And uh, if you wonder why they, they had those aircraft quality uh, seats at the consoles, if watching that thing snap back and forth, uh, it's just pretty impressive. I don't know if anybody would have survived that. Okay, hardness verification of the new Minuteman 2 facilities. Minuteman 2, was installed in uh, brand new and different facilities, slightly different facilities at uh, Grand Forks. And so they needed to test whether or not those have been built properly or were gonna resist properly. So Lund's facility M28 was selected and isolated from the rest of the squadron. This is what a 133B outfit looks like. The um, Launch, the launch, launcher support building was much more extensive than the early versions. Explosion sequence. This is the just before the detonation. This is just after it started. And this is after it's pretty much taking place. This photo I just remembered I had from my book. This is a ground level shot of that same sequence. And you can tell a couple of things from it. One, the scale I think is amazing. And two, the explosion started on the left-hand side and it's just, uh, well, it's well underway. It's just beginning on the right-hand side. So the wave traveled from the left to the right as evidenced by the higher overburden shooting up on the left. This was not as, uh, well, they revealed what needed to be revealed. The launcher equipment room was uh, displaced slightly from um, on this test of, at uh, Grand Forks. And they had to reposition a $3 million launcher equipment room they excavated and put jacks underneath and put it back in the, in the position. I just, I, I can't conceive of how they did that, but they did. So 3,000 PSI overpressure was achieved and the launcher equipment room had to be repositioned and the launcher support building had to be repositioned. Test four was the hardening improvements were made at wing six and across the rest of the wings. Five September, 1968, the test at Lima 16 was highly successful. And three, 11 hours after the explosion, they did a simulated launch of the ground test missile and it was uh, successful. So that's... Uh, reassuring to the Air Force that the system was was able to withstand the 
the nearby blast. And the blast that they were initially worried about was air blast, not a ground blast, because the inaccuracy of our weapons and the Soviet weapons was such that they wouldn't be targeting individual launch control centers. They'd be targeting the uh, missiles themselves. But with the advent of the SS-9, the accuracy was such that now they believed the Soviets could target the launch control centers, which was one per 10 missiles. So by, by blowing up 15 launch control centers, you could prevent the launch of the missiles, the rest of the missile field. So that had the Air Force quite worried. The deployment of the SS-9 began in 67. So there was quite reasonably a need for alternative basing for the proposed replacement to Minuteman Rome Numero 3. This came up with, they, they went through all kinds of bizarre um, ideas, almost as nutty as some of the ideas for Peacekeeper. But they came up with what was called the Hard Rock Silo Program. This required new verification testing techniques. The first one was called uh, diest. Diest was buried vertical arrays of explosives to produce a ground blast wave characteristic of a surface contact detonation. Then they did diest hest, which was a combination of air blast and directly induced ground motion. Plane wave and Datex were developed a series test series developed to refine the diehaz technique. There was a new explosive, DBA. I think that doesn't refer to doing business as, but X2M slurried ammonium nit aluminum ammonium nitrate. For the first test, the Datex test, we'll be talking about shortly, there are 29 one foot diameter, 65 or 75 deep, foot deep holes. They filled with explosive and they had cutouts that, to allow concrete to be poured down with, they call them key waves, to keep the, the force of the explosion from just blowing out the top. Hand deck was another one. This was the development parameters for combined diehest and hest test. They did this pre-development work so they didn't have to uh, take off uh, Minuteman facilities off alert. They had to time the two explosions very carefully because the uh, ground wave came after the shock wave. This is a typical layout for a diehest well, it should be diehest hest. So here's the hest structure. And then over here, this line is the line of diehest um, holes. So the, the blast wave would go this way across and then would ripple this way um, with the hest facility. So Datex Roman numeral two was a, an experiment to validate a tenfold increase in the diehest explosives. There's 200 feet by 65 foot, 41 tons of aluminized ammonium nitrate slurry. Four silo models were built unlined smooth walls, six feet in diameter, 15 feet deep. Uh, structure S3 was six feet in diameter and 15 feet deep with a steel covert liner backfilled with nine inches of concrete. They had expectation that these things would survive the, um, whoops. Oh. So this is the array, S1, was severely damaged, displaced six feet. S2 displaced two feet. S3, the top five feet 
was displaced 13 feet away from the rest of the structure. The bottom 10 feet was displaced relatively little. S4, which was 20 feet away from S2 and S3, suffered very little damage. This is a detail of what happened with S3. That top five feet were sheared off and moved uh, 13 feet away. This is an example of S4. You see it's just a little bit of deformity. This is S, the top of S3. Now, granted, a steel culvert isn't the most rigid material, but I think they were all surprised when it was sheared off and moved. They validated the increased overpressure structure. They could do that. So rock test one was going to validate that. And 20 feet of overburden, 2 million feet of 40, 400 grain prime accord. The experimental structures was a 27 foot diameter stub silo with an experimental closure. The rock one and rock two tests, a lot of it is still highly classified. A one quarter scale model of the 27 foot diameter stub silo four six-foot diameter and two three-foot diameter experimental closures, and then two six-foot six diameter, 39-foot deep silos, one lined and unlined. This seems very repetitive, but they wanted to collect as much information as possible for a comparison between the tests. This is an aerial view. I did locate the uh, quarry where they developed this, but it's been uh, so beaten up. I was gonna drive out and see if I could see any of the remains of this. This is in New Mexico. It's only about six hours from Tucson, but Google Earth showed me that this would probably be a waste of my time. So this is the stub silo closure and it's two inch, two inch steel, weighed 55,000 pounds. 27 feet in outside diameter. That's just, he did, well, the guy's welding on the little stubs for the reinforcing bars. This is before another view of where the stub silo is going. This is a entry point for uh, accessing the silo to look at it after the blast to see what damage was incurred. The rock test results, 3,000 PSI overpressure achieved, minimal damage to the structures. Experimental design for rock test two. This is gonna demonstrate the combination of air blast overpressure and the subsequent ground motion, followed by a direct pulse on a large scale. Experimental structures, they had this conceptual silo. I can't find much more about it, but it had a variety of, of different silo diameters and designs, which I'll show you briefly in a minute. Silo models, 26 feet in diameter, 35 feet deep. Antenna elements, samples of the hardened intersite cable, samples of silo closures of various diameters. The test bed covered 100,000 square feet. So this is the original uh, layout. Not much detail, obviously. The explosion displaced a 80 by 150 foot block, causing horizontal displacement of 10 to 12 inches, encompassing the top portions of SO3 SO6 and SO7. Now it doesn't seem like much, 10 to 12 inches, but that's quite a quite a bit when you're thinking of having a facility withstand and be ready to launch a missile. The SO3 closure 
was upturned and taken off of the, the silo model. The top of SO7 was displaced 6.5 inches uh, horizontally. And again, this sounds like very little, but if you take the wall of something that's supposed to be holding a missile and you move it a foot or even six inches in a sudden shock, now that's not gonna be good for the missile. So this is the size block that moved. And what they found with all the rock one and rock two tests was there was no way to predict, no matter how much they surveyed the soil, where, what block of rock would move and how far. So you see this one reasonably small block, 05, 02, and 04 aren't even damaged, but 07, 06, and 03 got hammered and 01, the, uh, the uh, conceptual silo wasn't damaged pretty much at all. So this is what the conceptual silo design looked like. The walls of a Minuteman silo, the launcher equipment room walls are two and a half feet, two and a quarter foot thick. The walls of the rest of the silo, of the rest of the launch tube, are a foot and a half thick. Here, these were designed to be four foot thick, minimum. So unlike the sliding door they had for Minuteman um, as it's deployed now, they came up with, a, I found a paper that has a bunch of different closure designs. This one struck me as being, well, like I said, I'm a plant biochemist, not an engineer. But here, you'd have the silo at rest, missile container and closure at rest. There'd be a large debris field covering it. Then they, this is a part I don't understand. They would get 12 million pounds of hydraulic pressure and push the missile container on the left. The actuator for the closure, they push it up through the 35 feet of uh, debris. And then they'd swing the door open and launch the missile. That just seems like a really crazy idea to me. So in summary, there was concern about the as-built hardness of the missile of minimum and launch facilities. The, the, the deficiencies they found they needed to test. It was not so much they were built in correctly. It wasn't a matter of the contractors cheaping out. It was a matter of local geology, which they just didn't really fully understand until they did these tests. The problems were mitigated to a large extent by the forced modernization program. So hard rock silo, it turned out to the, the experiments showed it was gonna be incredibly expensive to build in the hard rock uh, environment. So while it, it seemed feasible to some, it doesn't seem feasible to me because they, you can't predict the movement of those blocks of rock. Um, you could build all the walls you want. They came up with some super hard concrete with metal fibers, and they were they were promoting that for Peacekeeper, but did not do it. So at the time, the question of the vulnerability of the land-based strategic forces opened a debate to continue to the deployment of the peacekeeper system. And now for the new Sentinel program, they're going to use the old, the original launch tubes for Minuteman, but rebuild the launcher equipment room and support buildings and the launch control facilities. So with all this testing, it still came down to the fact that it was just going to be incredibly expensive and difficult and time consuming to make uh, that many new silos. So that's pretty much all I have for today. I'm happy to take questions if anybody has any. Wow, fascinating. I do have um, 
just to, to start, <clears throat> I do have a question in the chat. Um, this is from Joe Romito. Um, so he has a big picture question. Minuteman 3 is still deployed today. Are the current silos uh, and launch control centers considered vulnerable or are they adequately hardened? Well, I'd have to say from my not so humble opinion, um, if you if you land the accuracy of the Soviet, of the Russian weapons and our weapons are such that you can land them pretty darn close. Um, and you don't, you just have to take out the launch control center. So I would say they're protected against a limited attack by, uh, let's say, perhaps the Chinese or North Korea. But if the Soviets, the Russians wanted to take out our, our facilities, um, they could, and they could back then. It was a matter of the, the problem of starting. We'd have launched before they could get to our facilities. I'm sure of that. Mm -hmm. So I guess my basic answer is no, they're not well enough protected. But in a way, it's a moot point because we would have already launched right. that armistice off. Well, and the accuracy is, you know, there's a, there's a cottage industry of strategic thinkers at various uh, academic institutions that came up with single shot, as they call it, single shot kill probabilities and all these various academic exercises. Um, they, if you take like reliability, if you have a system that's 0.9% and a point, a 90% reliable and guidance, 90% reliable and launch. 90% reliable and uh, propellants igniting properly. You multiply all that together, you get down to the 70% for the use of the weapon system. But that's coming with 90% uh, uh, quality and three different levels. So I guess my point is, if you're gonna have a nuclear war, you don't have to be very accurate. Because just with Titan and with Miniman, you didn't have to dig these things out of the ground. With Titan, all you had to do was put six inches, six inches of dirt on that silo closure door and it couldn't open. So you don't have to be very close. You just need to get the ejector from the crater to cover the, uh, the silo closure. And that's true with Miniman. It's more, it's classified. I, I don't know the number for Minuteman door opening because it slides instead of um, Titan would lift up and then slide back and the jacks lifting it up were the problem with uh, the weight. I'm gonna open it up for any any other questions. I know it's a lot of numbers, but um, unfortunately, there wasn't much in the way of graphics. Um, hello. Uh, thank you for your lecture. Um, I'm interested in the reliability of the uh, guidance system, and for the particularly for the older missiles um, that or in, in in the system that are being uh, stored today how are how re, how is the reliability assured uh, do you, is there some sort of uh, interrogation of the electronics that are conducted at, uh, to assure that they are maintaining their functionality yeah, yeah, the, the guidance system are constantly monitored. With the newest system they have, it's much easier to keep it uh, monitored and accurate. The older system had to use something called the azimuth alignment set, and they'd align it with a, a device sitting on the side of the silo. And that had some issues with reliability. But no, the guidance system now is... is to my knowledge, the guidance system has rarely been an issue with the failure at launch. Usually it's the RV or 
um, one of the stages. But the guidance systems are, are very highly, highly accurate and highly reliable now. Okay, thank you. If you want to read more about the guidance systems, there's a couple of really good books. Uh, one I'm pleased to say is mine, but <laughs> uh, the other is one called Inventing Accuracy. I uh, can't recall the name of the author. He's Scottish. But Inventing Accuracy is a wonderful description of the progression with the Draper Laboratory at MIT and uh, Rockwell. I was able to interview two of the designers of the Minute, early Minuteman system. Uh, it was fascinating. What, what people could do in the 60s, early 60s with the slide rule continues to amaze me. But I, I highly recommend the Inventing Accuracy. It's kind of pricey, but it's got, uh, it's, it's really beautifully written. Uh, I'm going to put information in the chat. It's called Inventing Accuracy, a Historical Sociology of Nuclear Missile Guidance. Donald Angus McKenzie. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There's another one. <clears throat> oh, golly, what's it? Not inventing accuracy. Another one by one of the guidance engineers from North American. I'm trying spacing on it now. But yeah, one of the criticisms of my book was by one of the people that worked at the Minuteman book is one of the people that worked with uh, at the Draper lab. And he said, I should have written far more about the guidance system. But if he read the introduction, he'd realize I was writing a book about the Minuteman program, not about Minuteman guidance system. Sure. So I leave it to him to write that book. They still using these uh, Minutemans today. I know a lot of them have been abandoned, and people actually turn them into houses. They live in them. No, no, that's not true. Um, the the ones that have been turned into houses are the Titan One, Atlas, and and Titan Roman numeral two. We have a guy who's a uh, on call, a pharmacist in Tucson, and he bought one, and converted it into. Uh, uh, well, I can't. I never went to see it, but he bought one. Several people have bought them around uh, Little Rock and Wichita. But no, all the Minuteman, the Minuteman silos have been reduced to Minuteman three, about four hundred out of the thousand that used to be deployed due to various treaties. And they're going to build. They're going to refurbish for the four hundred fifty that still remain silos but they can only have 400 missiles uh, as per treaties. But none of the Minuteman facilities, to my knowledge, have been uh, converted to anything. Okay, my, and, my brother lives in upstate New York, and uh, there's, I guess it's a different type of system up there. Yeah, it's, it's an Atlas in. F, Plattsburgh, Atlas F. Yeah, I, yeah, he lives in Plattsburgh, that's right, thank you. Yeah, no, you're welcome. They did decommission, um, and and many of the Minuteman early Minuteman silos, uh, but they filled them in with dirt or blew the headworks. But no one's living in. I think there's. Uh, I don't know if it's a Minuteman or some other one uh, I had seen on TV that they they actually open it up and you can go uh, tour it. I'm not really sure where that is. It may be That's the one that. That's outside of Tucson in Suarita. I used to be the tour guide there. Okay, and that is a Minuteman? No, that's Titan, Titan oh. II. Highly okay. recommend if you're in, there are two things you should do if you come to Tucson. You should go to the Sonora Desert Museum, an absolutely unique um, zoo slash museum, which has a hummingbird aviary that is extraordinary. Wow. And the other thing you should do is go visit the Titan Missile Museum. I, I guess no Minutemen are, are open because if they're still used, like they're I guess they're still classified. Oh yeah. And, uh, believe me, writing a book about the Minuteman program, I came up against uh constantly came up against classification issues. But Titan Roman numeral two was easy to write about because it had been deactive for 
20 years. So there was a lot more information I could get. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you a question about that. In your, you know, writing, how do you, where do you find all this information? I mean, some of it I find fascinating that it's not still classified. Um, well, I had uh, 250 gigabytes worth of data for this book, for the Minuteman book. And I donated all of that to the uh, Air, Air Force. So, and actually the Smithsonian Institute, uh, Museum has their first digital archive was uh, the material I sent them. Um, how do I find it? Um, dogged determination on the internet, uh, visiting various facilities that might have it stored. Uh, some of the stuff on Minuteman Motors, the uh, motors, the three stages, they had dumped as waste at Vandenberg Air Force Base. They were throwing it out. And two good friends of mine found out about it and just dumpster dived and got all kinds of unclassified material that was very useful for my book. Huh. So one of the problems they were worried about when I started writing the book was this concept of aggregation, where you take several things that are not classified, you put them together and it becomes classified. Right. <laughs> Uh, they were very concerned. My my point of contact with Global Strike Command was very concerned that I was going to find my book was going to be redacted heavily. Not one word was redacted out of that book. But 30% of the book is references. <laughs> so Interesting. So um how how long was the uh, classification review process? So the beginning, at the very beginning, at uh, Air Force uh, Historical Research Agency at Maxwell. This is back when did I start writing that? About 20, 2015. I could get turnaround within two weeks. There was a declassification officer there that was intrigued with my writing this book. And he could get uh, stuff declassified pretty quickly. And a couple years into writing the book, all of a sudden it dried up. And what happened was he had sent one of my requests higher up the food chain and somebody got pretty mad and said, you shouldn't be giving this guy any of this stuff. <laughs> and so that, uh, that dried up. But before that, uh, it was wonderful because it's been my experience with historical archives. When an archivist hears that you're actually going to do something with what you're writing about, what you're inquiring about, they get very excited. One thing that really uh, pleased me with this latest book, the book on the hit to kill technology, I read about a document called, um, you know, I'm spacing on it now. It was a two, oh, Project Defender. It was a two volume, 1300 page document that I read about and was still highly classified. And so I said, well, I better not bother trying to get it declassified. Then I, I decided to try. And I wrote to a contact at the National Archives, who's the uh, head of the Freedom of Information Act Department. I called him and asked if he knew where, if there was a copy in the archives. And he said, yes, but uh, I've got some bad news. It's an empty box. There's a, a note where the two fold, the two volumes are. And I'm tracking them down for you. So he, he called me back and said, I found them. And I said, so are they highly classified? Am I going to be able to get any information from them? And he said, well, let me check. He put the phone down. He walked down to the Air Force officer that was involved in declassification, came back about five minutes later and said, nope, you can have the whole thing. So I have the uh, distinction of putting that on the web soon. Um, so it can happen quickly, but it is amazing what stuff that was the flights in the early 60s of these missiles, what's that, 60 plus years now, and they're still classified. Wow. 
I wanted to write a book about Peacekeeper, but I was informed by a very good friend who knows uh, most of the Peacekeeper material that I would have liked to have gotten, like with Minuteman, has been destroyed. Huh. Yeah, that's frustrating. Yeah. Any other any other questions? Hmm. Well, maybe before we depart, David, I know you know I briefly mentioned that you have your sixth book uh, pending publication. I don't know if you want to just uh, let let the folks here know a little bit about your sixth book. Well, it's um, a brief history of hit to kill technology. What they do now to intercept incoming reentry vehicles is they don't blow them up. They impact them with a hit to kill. It's kinetic energy that does the destruction, not explosives. And I was fascinated by how you develop something like that. So I started doing some research and it, it actually started with a program of where they used these extra, the retired Miniman 1A, 1A, 1B, and Miniman 2 airframes have been converted to use as target vehicles and launch vehicles. And I've started writing a book about that, but the politics of that agency, um, I knew several of the former commanders of the facilities and, and I asked them if they'd be interviewed and they said, not on the record. So as I was researching that, I learned about they were providing targets for this testing, this hit to kill technology. And it turns out a very good friend works for Raytheon that makes the, the uh, hit to kill vehicles. So I decided to write a book about that. It's relatively short compared to the 600 page Minuteman book, but it's got some fascinating information and pictures and illustrations of, uh, of how you build something to hit a, hit a well, how do they call it? Hit a, like hit a rifle bullet with a rifle bullet. Um, the extraordinary technology. Wow. said it couldn't be done and it was done and it's been done reliably. And as I said earlier, um, I think maybe I was just talking to Eleanor on uh, Sunday, they had a launch Sunday or Monday, maybe it was Monday, they had a launch and it was successful. The hit to kill vehicle destroyed the, the decoy RV. So that was really sweet to know if the system's working. It's not 100% uh, reliable, but I look at it this way. If we have a system that can be 50% reliable and North Korea lobs a couple of missiles our way, I prefer to fire three or four of these interceptors, hoping one work, than not have any interceptors at all, because they wanted to save money. Yeah. Well, maybe we can have you back for uh, another briefing uh, on that uh, that topic. So I'll yeah, have to talk, talk to you about that. I'd be happy to do it. Cool. It's a fascinating subject. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. I apologize for all the detail, but this is the kind of stuff that floats my boat. So <laughs> we like details, so so it's all good. So um, so thank you again. Uh, really appreciate this, and uh, please join us uh, in January for the kickoff of our 2024 uh, webinar slash lecture series uh, with a discussion about the ENIAC women, the early computers uh so looking forward to to that lecture coming up and um thanks again and happy holidays everybody and stay safe yeah okay. thank you and um thanks david i see that eleanor has sent us an email so I look forward to getting in touch with you great presentation oh well, thank you I'll, I'll send you john hilliard's name um i don't know that he can do anything but I, I always like seeing if I can arrange for people to get behind the scenes tours. So I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Awesome. Take care, everybody. Merry Christmas. All right. Yeah, Merry Take Christmas. Care. Yeah. Bye bye. All right. Good night, everyone. <laughs>